All right, uh, so I'm moving along here with uh, the art of Franz von Stuck. Here we are entering into um, his second Saturn cycle, 1894 to 1901, that seven year period, which ends his early phase. And then we're going to look at the third Saturn cycle, 1901 to 1908, which is this, the first half of his middle phase, which is 1901 to 1915, which is the apogee of his art. And uh, pretty much his best work is done during this period, even though after 1908, he starts to fall out of favor. And I think that may have been one of the reasons why he painted less and less. I think he was less and less confident with time after um, the vogue of Art Nouveau had passed. By 1910, it was pretty much over with. And modernists like uh, who had been pupils of his, Kandinsky and Paul Klee, came along uh, inaugurating German modernism phase two. Um, and uh, so, all right, so let's take a look now. Here we have um, Satter with a Flute. 1894, uh, very characteristic of his early period. And here we have Battling Centaurs, which now is his attempt, once again he's dialoguing with Arnold Bierkland's uh, 1873 Battling Centaurs, uh, but I don't think it holds up. I think Birkeland, uh, is Birkeland's work is much better, and I think when Stuck dialogues directly with a previous Birkeland painting, he usually comes up short. It's usually not his best work, and the Birkeland painting is usually better. Stuck is at his best when he's being original, using Birkeland's characters like nymphs and fauns and centaurs, but not dialoguing with specific paintings. Um, okay, so here is 1895 now, The Kiss of the Sphinx. Um, and long about this time, he starts teaching at the Munich Academy, which is where he had gone. Munich was the place that he remained all the way down the line. The Nazis liked his work quite a bit. He was uh, one of their favorites, um, which didn't do him any <laughs> didn't do him any good. His subsequent reputation, even though he was never a Nazi, he was never associated with them at all. Um, and here we have 1896 now. Two dancers. The art is absolutely self luminous at this point. Um, these two dancers dancing uh, against a black background so that the figure stands out against the ground. He's completely eliminated perspectival space. Yet again, there is no perspective here. These are just figures minus ground. They are a world unto themselves, the same way that an Eskimo carving, let's say, of a polar bear out of uh, ivory, um, walrus ivory, uh, it is a world unto itself. It's not in a world, it is a world. Same thing here. Um, and then he goes back and reworks uh, Sin yet again in 1897. Recall that we had seen Sensuality in 1891 and then the masterpiece of the series, 1893, The Sin. This is also called The Sin. Um, I don't think it's as good as either of the earlier two. Uh, I think he should have left it alone. And then we have one of his marvelous sculptures here, very neoclassical in style. It doesn't come across as modernist at all when he switches to the medium of sculpture, Amazon on horseback, um, and a very beautiful image, very streamlined. And then here we have the painterly equivalent of it with Fighting Amazon of the same year, 1897, uh, very beautiful. You can see a little battle through her lower left helmet there with uh, centaurs battling Amazons now. Um, and then Pallas Athena, where now he retrieves, I think for the last time, the, the Byzantine gold background that he had started with in paintings of his early phase, such as uh, Orpheus and, uh, and the uh, homage to uh, painting. Here we have uh, Pallas Athena plugged into the same uh, iconotypical space, the Byzantine gold ground. Once again, the, it's figure minus ground, the elimination of... Uh, and those Byzantine uh, paintings are, of course, pre-perspectival. And then uh, this period finishes up here with Seesaw. Uh, oh, what sort of naughty thing is going on here in this painting? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a very beautiful painting, and it's naughty. Um, and then we have uh, Cinderella uh, inaugurating this, uh, I believe, let's see, are we at the third Saturn period here, which was 1901 uh, to 1908. So... Um, and this is not quite there, 1899, Cinderella. And then um, this beautiful, lovely portrait of this woman, whoever she was, Frau Fies, 1900. 
And then he returns to the motif of the fun ride here, uh, like the seesaw, the naughty seesaw. This is a, this is a naughty uh, fun ride on the back of a centaur. Uh, the arc of the motion is quite dynamic, and it just carries you along with it. And once again, I've included the frame here because he has designed the. He liked to design his own frames, and then um, sunset at the sea is what concludes this uh, second Saturn phase. Uh, beautiful little sunset uh, painting. And then so we begin with the third Saturn phase with At the Source, which is dialoguing once again, uh, I don't think specifically with a Birkeland painting, but with Birkeland's world. Uh, it's a very beautiful painting, and it also is dialoguing with his own painting, the one we had seen uh, in the previous video, uh, the one with the piper sitting up on the edge of the cliff piping, and the mermaid with two fishtails crawling up uh, out of the water, uh, summoning uh, summoning her from the collective unconscious. I think the same thing is happening here. The nymph, only the roles have traded places. The it's the it's the mythological figure now doing the piping, and the human female, but still associated with with water, with the source, with the the muses and inspiration coming up out of the watery abyss uh, at the the call of the uh, the pan pipes. And then so uh, here we have the same model. It looks like that he used. Very beautiful that he used for Cinderella, now here personifying spring. Uh, and she will do so again in a moment here. And then this astonishingly beautiful portrait of his daughter, uh, Mary. Uh, his wife was named Mary and so was his daughter. In 1902, Mary with the red hat. And it almost looks like stained glass. It is so self-luminous. Uh, it is radiating its own energy. And once again, note too that Berkeley, or, uh, Stuck has eliminated the background. Uh, it's just this interesting kind of greenish mesh that he has swapped out for the gold ground of the Byzantine uh, uh, background in uh, Pallas Athena. And uh, so here we have, it looks like the same model yet again as Fruling, uh, Spring, uh, dialoguing here with Botticelli's Primavera. Uh, but there again, I think uh, Botticelli has him beat. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's beautiful nonetheless. And then uh, Young Fawn. Uh, this little devilish looking baby that looks like something out of uh, a horror film, like perhaps out of the end of uh, Angel Heart with Robert De Niro and Mickey Rourke. I think such a creature appears at the end of that film. Um, a very devilish looking creature, um, but beautiful and fun. He's in the period of his mastery now. This is the middle phase where everything he does is just spectacular. I wish that I could have found a higher resolution version of this, the ride. He returns back to the motif now of the erotic ride, that we had first seen with the seesaw going back and forth, then the, the fun ride with the woman on the back of the centaur naked, and then these three women who are naked on the back of another centaur who's just carrying them along, apparently innocently, piping the song of Dionysus, perhaps, the erotic song. And then uh, this is one of my favorite paintings of his, Wounded Amazon. He liked to paint Amazons, uh, Amazons fighting centaurs, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, and she's wounded on her right breast, there was, in uh, classical mythology, the idea that Amazons ha had to sacrifice one of their breasts. So they had to cut one of their breasts off in order to become an Amazon. And so the, uh, the sculpture of Diana, uh, Artemis, uh, at Ephesus has, uh, is the famous, uh, I should have included an image of it here, has the famous uh, multi-breasted Artemis, which is perhaps a reference to Amazons offering her their breasts. Um, all right, so... Back to the world of the Sphinx. He likes Sphinxes. And this is a particularly beautiful one with the water flowing in the background. And we see the red cloth here that he has, uh, that we saw back in the first video with his version of Iphigenia and the same red cloth that he had taken from Berkland's uh, Ulysses and Calypso. Uh, he retains that here. And then uh, here we get a self-portrait of him. You can see the Amazon painting there with the red shield in the background. He's working on a new painting, um, very self-confident uh, looking individual, and that's inside his house. His house actually did look like that. He was building it in 1897 and 98, called the Villa Stuck, um, and designing everything. He designed the walls, the architecture, uh, the sculpture. He did it all himself. He was quite versatile in his talents. And here we have then... Uh, 1905, men fighting over a woman, 
this sort of primordial scene, it almost looks like there might be volcanoes smoking in the background. Perhaps it's difficult to make out. And these two Neanderthal types uh, fighting over a single woman with red flaming hair uh, as though her hair were lava, matching the primordiality of this. He'll go back to this painting in his final phase, which is very sparse. Um, he almost completely stopped painting. And there's only a few from that final phase. And this is one of them that he reworks. And here we have um, Orestes with the Furies, or being pursued by the Furies. So we see him running in the foreground and then the three uh, Fur uh, Furies behind him. Once again, he's dialoguing here, I think, uh, unsuccessfully with Arnold Birkeland, who has an assassin pursued by Furies in this painting here. And once again, Birkeland uh, uh, has the better painting. Um, he should just leave Birkeland alone directly anyway. Here, back to, he's returned back to the erotic uh, centaur ride, the naked woman on the back of the centaur. Uh, it's a fun painting. I like it quite a bit. And then uh, one of the few biblical iconotypes, uh, the dance of Salome, when she is dancing, um, because John the Baptist has been talking shit about her, her mother, and, um, and uh, Herodias, and then she demands his head, and Salome does a sexy dance for King Herod, and uh, he, he says, I'll give you whatever you want, and uh, so they bring in the head of John the Baptist, and notice that here it's glowing, it, as though it has a, a halo around it. Self Again, it's like a bioluminescent fish at the bottom of the ocean. And then finally for this period, the very spectacular painting, Inferno, 1908, which brings us to the next Saturn cycle and concludes the second and third Saturn cycles in the first half of his middle period. And it's at this point that he begins to fall out of fashion and pretty much lose his fame. And so it's downhill from this point on as far as the fame goes, but he still kept painting uh, spectacular paintings, as we'll see in the next video, some of his best work. And I like here how he has taken the serpent from the sin paintings, um, but transformed it into a totally self-luminous uh, creature, this glowing uh, in the abyss, in that very lava kind of background there. Uh, this is a wonderful depiction of uh, Dante's Inferno. Fantastic. Reminds me a bit, actually, of a bar in New York City. Uh, some of the bars are like this, people sitting around looking miserable um, and trying to look cheerful. All right, so that brings us uh, through the uh, middle phase, or at least half of it, uh, completing the early phase and moving through the middle phase of the great painter Franz von Stuck.